and welcome to the Crummy Talk. Today we are discussing the pandemic, online dating and regulations, um, or the lack thereof. Um, so you've got myself, Janice, you've got Tyler, and we've got Laura. She hasn't got her camera on today. So if you're listening, you won't know the difference, but if you're watching, yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so basically, we're just going to run through three quick questions, just to give our opinion and you know, voice our certain concerns about the topic. Um, and we thought it was quite interesting to talk about it. It was actually another team member's kind of idea, but she's not with us today. Um, but just, you know, the concept of online dating um, over the past few years, it's emerged so much. Um, you know, you, even now we're seeing things like on TV, like The Circle, um, and then, you know, statistics in our um, in one of our resources, we exp- express that statistics show that one in three relationships now begin online. Our grandparents or parents may never have experienced that, but us as a generation, that's it's, it's become normal to, you know, start a relationship online. Um, but then you've got the dark side of online dating where, you know, we hear of the Tinder killer or um, the grinder killer who we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, and then, you you know, you just generic dating websites. There's so many more of them than there were before. before at one point it was just, I don't even know, I think maybe match.com was probably like the first online website I have ever heard of. Um, but then, you know, you've got your apps, your e-harmonies, your different versions um, and stuff like that. And, you know, so with it being February and the month of love, we thought, why not discuss it? So just moving on and moving forward, I'll just throw out the question. So I don't know who wants to go first in answering, but kind of what risks would you associate with online dating um, specifically? Tyler, do you want to go first? As you've actually got your camera on and people can see you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll go first. Uh, One risk that I sort of came up with was not so much, like not not what you'd think about in terms of crime at the beginning is catfishing. Uh, Sort of like people Mm. online who act like they're a certain person or create like an alias for themselves online and just mess with people. You know, I don't know if people have seen the TV show on MTV, Catfish. Um, a lot of the people and uh, do it just to just because they're bored or you know they feel like oh I can't go out and meet people but sort of it, it's kind of easy for that to turn into sort of criminal enterprise sort of pretending to be someone that's vulnerable asking for money off people who they're supposedly in love with and um, just basically robbing people and that can also turn into sort of meeting the people and it can lead to assault and different types of violent crime so and I think it's hard for people to police it as as well because you don't know who the person is until you go out and meet them in real life and especially with the pandemic you can't do that at the minute well not in the UK anyway otherwise you're breaching lockdown rules and we're not going to get into that um so that that's one risk anyway yeah um any for you Laura that you can think of yeah I I mean oh sorry 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 yeah, I mean, obviously we get, you know, the most sort of extreme risks, um, you know, like you mentioned with the with the grinder killer, etc. And I think Tyler mentions a really interesting point. We're talking about the fact that um, it's become so much harder to police since the obviously during the pandemic, because obviously one of the things that we kind of naturally, I, I don't know about you, Tyler, so much, but I know that certainly, Janice, you and I have literally done it before. If you're out with a with a female friend, colleague, whatever, you text that person, make sure that, you know, they, that you agree to text each other when you get home, one thing, another. Time was, um, you know, before the pandemic, when if you were going to meet someone that you didn't know, you might say to your friend, family member, whatever, look, I'll text you when I arrive and I'll text you when I leave and I'll let you know if I, you know, if I decide to go somewhere else with them or where I am, etc. Now, because of lockdown, those people are breaching lockdown. Obviously, they shouldn't be. But if they are, they're not going to feel comfortable with doing that so much because they don't want to let other people know that they're already in the breach of the law. And that puts them at, at even further risk. Not only then, obviously, are they at risk of, of the of of um, COVID, but they're also then at, then I because they're vice that you know because of um, being potentially isolated, they're at greater risk of um, something happening and, and nobody knowing where they are. So I think that's a major risk, and I think there have been some reports that actually um, 
people are not coming forward when they've been assaulted after dates because of um, because of the fact that they know they've, they've breached lockdown. The other thing that I think is, it's not really a criminological thing, but I still think it's important to kind of consider from a social science perspective, is that use of dating apps is associated with lower self-esteem. So in particular, like, you know, you already mentioned the, the difference between like Match.com and, and, and sites like t apps like Tinder that we've got, you know, world of online dating has changed massively. And there's far less stigma now attached to meeting your partner on an app than the than there used to be when, you know, when online dating first became a big thing. People now, you know, accept it's a perfectly normal way to meet people. But repeated use of an app where you can just be quite brutally rejected and you may have matched with somebody and then found that they don't match with you. If you do that over time, it is associated with lower self-esteem. Now, whether it's because people who have lower self-esteem are looking for validation on apps like that, they think they might get validation, then, it, then that, that doesn't happen or, or it's not enough to, to raise the self-esteem. Or whether it is, in fact, as simple as it looks, that actually it does, um, your self-esteem does take a knock if you repeatedly use those kind of apps who knows but i think that's a harm we don't necessarily think of automatically when we're thinking about online dating yeah it's a lot a lot of harm to it um and I, just add into that i think one thing that i considered was maybe like elements of crimes like re revenge porn and um and mm. things like that and you know adding to the point that you made about you know with the pandemic people are less inclined to come forward to talk about certain things that have happened um so you know maybe on your your normal day pre-pandemic um you know people sending pictures to each other videos to each other and stuff like that and then the element of revenge porn um falling into place and stuff like that people would probably go and report it um but people may feel a bit more afraid, you know, with the pandemic, do they want to leave the house? And I know there are loads mm. of, methods of, you know, reporting things to um, the authorities, but some people may not even feel comfortable with potentially reporting something like that and having the thought of, you know, a statement having to be taken. So, well, maybe I won't report it because an officer will have to come round. And if an officer comes round, I might be at risk of catching the pandemic. So um, it's just little things like that. Um, I think just adding to both of your points in regards to like deception and safety and um, the element of like regulate, um, regulating online activities. I think it was difficult pre-pandemic and I think it's even more difficult um, currently post-pandemic we're not really post-pandemic are we I think we're still in it to be fair I don't I don't think <laughs> yeah word, but, you know we're in the pandemic so um I definitely think there are many risks um associated to it but definitely the ones that you guys have mentioned I'd probably say are really up there um so with that being said my third question was actually I'm going to bring it up um so just adding to that, how do you think the pandemic itself has influenced online dating? So do you think overall it's hindered it or it's helped? Um, I think personally, it, it, it's a bit of a blurred line because it, I think it's hindered and helped um, because, you know, I've seen so many stories on, the, you know, in the media and on this morning or um, in the paper or, you know, of people falling in love over the pandemic, you know, because essentially, mm -hmm. you know, they haven't really got much else they can be doing or they've got, that, that was a really bad way to phrase it, but, you know, they've, they've got a lot more time on their hands. Some people have had, had a lot more time on their hands to actually communicate and find a partner and stuff like that. So I do think there are elements where it's helped people, especially those that you mentioned, you know, may have had lo low self-esteem, you know, going out and actually meeting people is difficult. Um, but I do think there's elements where, you know, from a crime point of view, a social harm point of view, and just a generic point of view that where it's, you know, there are elements where the pandemic's hindered things, but we've mentioned, touched on those before. What do you guys think? Um, I think sort of there's a lot of things for both sides, really. It's helped and hindered in its own way. I think in terms of like awareness of sort of like safety around online dating is probably going to be a bigger thing now now that people don't have a choice but to know about online safety because they can't go out. Um, but the only thing is, I think it's making people vulnerable to it. Maybe people who wouldn't have been doing it before, these new people jumping on it now during the pandemic, they can be sort of more susceptible to things like um, people wanting financial details off you, people... Um, you know, wanting more personal information and people are more likely to get personal information over the internet because they feel, I'm just talking to a screen at this point. I'm not, you know, not so much 
talking to another person, even though they kind of are, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I, I think that risk can be even even worse now because you don't have a choice at the moment. Yeah. Do you have anything to add on that, Laura? Oh. Uh, yeah, I just, yeah, completely agree. I think um, probably it has increased the, the use of, of online dating and, you know, things like Zoom dates and stuff are becoming more of a, of a thing than, than they used to be. But obviously, at the same time, it's it, it, it's pr- it's probably having some negative impacts on people who use it. Not only from all those um, sort of criminological um, angles that we've already discussed, but also in terms of I think everything in terms of of the online world has become kind of intensified, hasn't it? During lockdown, we're all effectively living online. So these kind of you know th- th- this contact, this um, you know the the contact that people are having with the people that they're meeting on these apps, etc it all becomes a a lot more sort of emotionally intense and a lot more sort of significant. So there might be some mental health um, connotations from that. Who knows? And we might also see, uh, you know, an increase in um, people reporting social anxiety, et cetera. You know, the the usual anxieties that people have after they've been talking to people online. What if they think I don't look like their my picture? What if, like Tyler mentions, what if they don't look like their picture? What if, you know, what if it isn't all it it seems to be? We might find that that has an impact post-lockdown, but obviously that remains to be seen. Yeah, I think that's something we'll maybe, you know, as and when, if we ever get out the other side of this, (laughs) because Part of me feels like we're never going to get out. We can only be optimistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe that's something we can kind of review um, in a few months or when, as I says, whenever, you know, seeing um, if the trends change or anything like that. Um, but just moving forward on to our final point. Um, so our case study this month um, to match our theme was Stephen Port, um, and he's known, also known as the Grinder Killer. When I like read through the case, I thought it was actually quite, one, gruesome, two, concerning, but three, very interesting. Um, definitely the mind of a criminology student. Um, but um, yeah, so essentially, just in short, um, he was found guilty of murdering um, four males that he met on Grinder. Um, it's believed that he um, raped them and, you know, drugged them and then murdered them. Um, there are rumours and speculation that he may have murdered more, but he was convicted of the four murders and um, a few other rapes as well. Um, and in 2016, he was subsequently sentenced to life. Um, the question that I was going to ask, but I feel like the question, the answer is just a given. So the question I was going to ask is, do you think that the punishment was acceptable? I personally think you can't get any bigger than life. Um, Mm. However, um, I just want to kind of add to the question, do you think it's worth further investigations to potentially identify if there were any other people that were murdered or harmed? Or do you think that, you know, he's in jail now, you know, justice has been served. So what's your viewpoint on that? Uh, I'll I'll start, I guess, because I've got the camera on. I, I think I think justice hasn't so much been done for any of the victims that have potentially been murdered. I feel like even though he's in prison for life, so what else is he going to do? You might as well try and probe more information and get more information from him as to whether there are anyone else, because it's not just the person that was murdered. That person has a family, that person may have kids, friends, you know, colleagues that may want to know. You know, to them, it might just be that they went missing when in actual fact they were a victim of the grinder killer. Um, so that that's my stance on it. I feel like the punishment is sort of is appropriate, but I feel like there are some bits, you know, there's an inquest going on about it at the moment. But um, there was some sort of like anxieties that he had during the police interview. And I think it's worth bringing up any potential sort of mental illnesses that he may have had. Um, maybe an anxiety disorder of some sort and maybe a problem with the police as well Um, I think it's evident that the police haven't had the best relationship with the LGBT LGBT plus community Um, so Mm. I think it's a good thing to weigh in on No definitely I agree Um, yeah I agree I didn't even know and I know that sounds really silly about the inquest as I'm much research I've done on this today um, Laura, do you have anything you want to add to, to that? 
Um, again, you know, agree what what Tyler's already said. Really, um, I do think that the punishment fits the crime. I think that a whole life tariff is entirely fair in a country where we don't have the death penalty. And I personally wouldn't be in favour of bringing in the death penalty. I think it's absolutely the the appropriate punishment. I don't think that there's evidence so far that he would be, you know, for example, that he would be, you know, sort of not guilty on the grounds of, of, of criminal insanity or that he would need to be removed to a psychiatric ward. So I, I think he probably is where he, he needs to be. In terms of um, whether there should be continued investigations, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because obviously... As brutal and harsh as it sounds, you always have the balancing of the victims' needs and the needs of the victims' families with the sort of wider public interest in terms of money, etc. And I'm not, um, you know, so uh, yes, I guess the most extreme two positions would be leave it as it is, or on the other hand, um, try and continue and even to the point of getting more convictions, um, you know, if if there's evidence. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say that the that it would be um, in the public interest to take him to court again. But I certainly think that we need to be getting as much information as possible in terms of bringing closure to the families and gathering that evidence. Um, you know, if, you know, if for, for, for any reason, you know, if, if for no other reason, um, then obviously, A, it brings closure to the, to the families. Um, but B, also, it, it, this kind of information can always help us to, um, better prevent these kind of offences in the future, you know, especially when it, it's considered to be, you know, sort of almost uniquely 21st century kind of offence, you know, using dating apps, etc. Um, I think we, we need to get as much information about these kind of offences as we can. So I think definitely it's, it's not a, a kind of chapter in British criminal history that just needs to be closed. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. And I think, you know, lessons I always think when it comes to you know when certain offences crop up um like your, your less common ones for example like this one and I know like there have been serial killings in the country before um but serial killing as a whole it, compared to other offences isn't that common um and I do think mm -hmm. a lot of lessons can be learned from not just necessarily how the police have policed it or investigated the incident but just the wider criminal justice system and partnering agencies and stuff like that um can learn a lot from from the case um, so I definitely think if there is an opportunity to seek any further like information or um, any opportunities to just en in in enhance the case really, or, um, you know, to bring him to justice how and when possible, I think would be good in, you know, just A for learning lessons from, as I said, from partner agencies, please, the um, wider criminal justice system in how they deal with um, potential crimes like this, because as we've mentioned before, you know, the pandemic has, you know, potentially had an influence on online dating and we don't know what's to come. We don't know what's going to happen at the other end. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think that lessons can be learned from it and any opportunity to learn them, we should run with it. So um, that brings us to our competition question that we had this month. We asked you, Jesse, the Tinder killer Kempson was convicted for murdering Grace Mullane in 2020. What was the minimal sentence length for the offence? Was it A, 15 years, B, 17 years, or C, 23? Yeah. We had 14 entries for this um, competition, which is, I think, the most we've had for any of our competitions or any like um, kind of quizzes that we've run in the past. We have put everyone into a wheel and here, is how it went. Right, so yeah, as you can see, at Lely Kelly, who entered via Instagram, is our winner. So we will be getting in contact with her and sending the prize that we had, which was, um, gifted to us well essentially not gifted but provided to us by victim focus um and we're eternally grateful so well done lelly kelly um and that's yeah <laughs> <laughs>
you gotta give the clap round. Yeah. <laughs> we just start all clapping in circles now. Um, right. <laughs> so yeah, and um, that brings us to the end of our topic um, and the end of our discussion. So if you guys have got anything that you want to talk about or anything that we've mentioned that you kind of disagree on or you want to add to, um, just drop us a message, DM, comment, anything. Um, you can even comment underneath the video, like, comment, subscribe, the usual. Um, if you want to suggest any topics, because um, we're open and, you know, we want to discuss as many topics as possible. So if you've got anything that you want to talk about that's integral or important to you um, and you want to be on the panel, just, again, drop us a message. Um, and we've got a few more topics coming up in a few more discussions. So, yeah. And make sure you download the resource that we have to go with this episode. It's got a lot of inform more information about Stephen Port's case, um, a few recommendations to read, um, some tips on how to stay safe online, and a few more little gems. But if I tell you everything, then you won't download. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's it from me, Janice, Tyler, and Laura today. Thanks for watching or listening, however you um, tuned in to us. And we've been the Crimmy Talk. Yeah.